It once was a small fishing village. Now it's one of the most advanced cities in the world. We'll look at China's Shenzhen. Hello, I'm Mike Walter sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. It was quite the transformation. The southern city of Shenzhen celebrates its 40th anniversary as a special economic zone and has become a glittering area spearheading innovation. CGTN's Dai Kai walks us through Shenzhen's journey in becoming a potent symbol of China's commitment to reforms and opening up its economy. Shenzhen, widely known as the Silicon Valley of China, is the engine room of the country's technology and innovation. The city, with all the glitz and glamour today, merely consisted of farmland and dirt roads 40 years ago. It was not until Shenzhen was designated as a special economic zone in August 1980 that the city started turbocharging at what's known as Shenzhen Speed. In the late 1980s, the city started forming an export-oriented model, and by 1993, it took the crown in China's export and has sustained its position ever since. It's been a trailblazer on multiple fronts for China. In 2000, the city was the first in China to switch its development model from manufacturing to high technology. Soon, it was in full steam to experiment with leading-edge industries ranging from biotech to wearing devices. The city's economy has also expanded exponentially along the way. In 1979, Shenzhen's GDP stood at 1.97 million yuan, 40 years later, that figure soared to 2.6 trillion in 2019. And the growth momentum remains strong. An unparalleled supply chain, coupled with talents from all over the world, has made the city an oasis for entrepreneurs with ambitious visions. Aside from industry giants like Tencent, Huawei and DJI, a great number of startups have also been cropping up in the city. Shenzhen was designated as the demonstration pilot zone a year ago and is taking center stage in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. Dai Kai, CGTN. To talk more about Shenzhen, let's bring in our panel. Our first guest is in Shenzhen. James Sung is a Chinese-American tech investor joining us via Skype. From Beijing, Shindo Xu is a senior fellow at the Pangal Institution and host of CGTN's Dialogue Weekend. Here in the U.S., in Portland, Oregon, Yan Leong is a professor of economics at Willamette University, and Michael Santo is an economist and international affairs expert. He is coming to us from Miami. Thank you all for joining us. Shindo, why don't I start with you? Let's talk about these 40 years because it's really a remarkable story. Talk to us about what this has meant for Shenzhen, what it's been really even larger on the larger stage, what it means for China. Well, Shenzhen inside China is kind of uh, being unique. Uh, you know, it's called like a city of immigrants uh, because previously it is a fishing village. So it attracts people from the rest of the uh, country and then the rest of the world to build up this city as it is today, the fifth largest uh, in Asia. And so for the rest of the China, you know, basically a lot of experiment uh, experience and the, uh, for example, the, gov the governance, governance in terms of uh, uh, managing the market, a lot of the experience have uh, come from Shenzhen. So Shenzhen has been in, in the front line of China's reform and opening up. A lot of policies, you know, usually is being tested in Shenzhen and it's mature if it's uh, 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 ready to be recommended for the rest of the country, then it will be done. So that has been the case basically over the past 40 years. Now we are at the, uh, you know, another point that is that Shenzhen will continue to be the demonstration area or the test bed for new policies, a series of new policies, basically for further reform, uh, you know, reform and opening up. And James, uh, you've witnessed part of the story. You haven't been there for the full 40, but you've been there for 12 years. What's it been like watching this transformation? What's it been like in your 12 years? And, and what do the old timers say about the, the remarkable changes that have gone on in that city? This is a city where you can't blink because uh, every time I go on a trip and I come back, the city is different. Uh, new skyscrapers are coming up. Um, and basically, when I came to China uh, the first time, 
I, uh, I was looking for a place to stay, and uh, Shenzhen actually only had two metro lines at that point. And basically, I mean, I felt like Shenzhen was, a, was an easy place to understand, uh, as my Chinese was not that good at the time. Uh, and now today, it has uh, over a dozen metro lines. Uh, it's, there's so much going on in Shenzhen. I mean, the amount of deal flow that comes in every single day is incredible. I mean, there's opportunities for everybody here. And James, you were saying you really can't uh, can't blink. It changes so often. Talk to me about the vibrancy, the energy that comes in a city like that. Well, uh, just all over the city, I mean, you can see billboards that say, uh, you know, uh, when you come to Shenzhen, you're a Shenzhener, you know, which which means they encourage people to come to Shenzhen, to migrate to Shenzhen, and uh, really become Shenzhener, as Shenzheners, and uh, uh, they want people to invest, to really live here and uh, the ease of doing business is incredible. Um, I live in uh, the Shanghai free trade zone and over here uh, there's so many new policies here. Uh, for example, my uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, just uh, just created a new incubator and uh, they offer free uh, registration for businesses. I mean it used to be you know, uh, everyone's heard the story, you know, if, you, if you're a foreigner and you want to register a business in Shenzhen, uh, it takes like three months, uh, it takes uh, like six, seven thousand uh, dollars. But now you can actually do it for free and uh, they do it within a month. Wow. That's that's pretty impressive. Young Leong, uh, you know, in the piece that we aired there, it demonstrated this rapid industrialization. You see manufacturing, betting on that, goods being sent all around the world. But, you know, I think of uh, the United States and the Rust Belt, where everybody put their money on manufacturing. But the thing that's interesting about Shenzhen is it's constantly evolving, also putting bets on, on high tech. Talk to us about that piece of this story, because it's an important one, isn't it? Right, exactly. I think the success of Shenzhen is also how adaptive, how uh, evolving um, the whole economic structure is, right? So going from low-end manufacturing to now high-end manufacturing, and more importantly, it's taking a leadership role in finance and high-tech. So I think that's why, you know, Shenzhen is going to have another five years of high growth um, because the government is, again, uh, planning for another five-year uh, plan for Shenzhen. And this time around, the emphasis has been put on, you know, technological innovations and commercializing um, technology as well as, uh, you know, building the financial services um, to take a leadership role, again, in facilitating international capital flows, internationalization of the R&B uses. Um, so I think, yes, Shenzhen is very vibrant and dynamic in that sense. Let me ask you a follow-up. Uh, where is it in, placed within the world economy, and what's the ceiling? I mean, how, when you're talking about growth, you, you see the potential there. How, how big is the potential? Well, I think the potential is, um, it's very big, it's very unique for Shenzhen because this is, you know, even though this is one uh, relatively small country by area, um, it's got everything, right? It's um, the third busiest container port, so it has this vibrant uh, shipping and logistic network, um, and it's one of um, the area that has very many, you know, high-tech parks, um, so there is this um, technological innovation uh, going on. And it also has this unique position in the um, financial area, right, that it has been um, one of the first place to have the so-called bond connect. Um, it also has a stock exchange that has a lot of um, high-tech companies listing. So it's unique in the sense that it's a place where it builds a very nice ecosystem that includes shipping, logistics, um, high-tech, high-end manufacturing, and finance. And Michael, as you know, the Silicon Valley, of course, owned all these uh, high-tech firms in the United States. Shenzhen, often referred to as the Silicon Valley of China. Talk to us about the relationship between the two. Is there cooperation? How do you see that evolving? I mean, there's a lot of potential for cooperation, and there certainly is cooperation. There will be challenges, and there will be conflict as well. But I think the potential through cooperation uh, between Silicon Valley and Shenzhen is huge. So I think that's something that can, uh, especially in the, given the global nature of the economy, especially in technology. What about the relationship between the two countries right now? Does that, that's obviously been an obstacle with the trade uh, tensions. Uh, does that create barriers? 
Yeah, I mean, not barriers, just challenges and hurdles, some short term and some long term. I think it's natural that countries will have uh, occasionally differences in interests. Um, I think that one thing that's a little bit aberrational is uh, in the last few years, honestly, U.S. leadership has been, at least at the top, a little bit erratic. But the U.S. and China do have legitimate conflicts, um, you know, uh, related to, for example, intellectual property and ensuring that intellectual property is respected. But I think that China and the U.S., as the two world's largest uh, economies and because of the technology in the U.S. and China, they, the two countries can really, really get rich together. And I think that the secret for prosperity for China and the United States is to have very, very friendly relations and extensive economic ties, even beyond what we have today. Shindo, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping, of course, gave a speech marking this 40-year uh, anniversary. Let's listen to what he had to say. <laughs> The construction of special economic zones in the new era should uphold socialism with Chinese characteristics. We will move forward towards a new development stage, implement the new concepts, promote high-quality development, and build a new pattern. We will advance reform and opening up from a higher starting point and begin a new chapter in building special economic zones. So, Shindo, give me your take on his comments. Again, reform, opening up, a key a part of this speech. Well, you know, when we talk about uh, China's reform and opening up, uh, there, there used to be the concern that uh, China has been slow uh, in initiating more reforms and opening up to the outside world. Uh, well, if you look at what's happening in Shenzhen right now, you know, uh, you know China is conducting its business usually following its own pace. Sometimes it can be slow, but once it's determined, things will go, will move very fast. If you look at Shenzhen, you know, many, uh, I would say, potentials over there, for example, uh, because there's high author authorization from the central government. Basically, Shenzhen is now on par with uh, the municipalities like Beijing and Shanghai. That means it's more empowered to make its own decisions as it sees fit in terms of the use of land, in terms of, you know, residency system, in terms of attracting talents internationally, in terms of RMB, People are looking at a free exchange of RMB, probably starting from Shenzhen, and of course the trial of digital RMB in Shenzhen, etc. So Shenzhen will uh, remain in the front line in many areas in terms of those even controversial policies. Shenzhen will give will be given the leeway to do uh, to try on the trial basis to uh, you know initiating new policies and implement uh, implement those policies and then we will see what the result will be in general people are more, uh, very positive about the next five to ten years about Shenzhen and, and Shindo uh, Victor Gao who's been a guest on our uh, program quite a few times was quoted in the Washington Post as saying that uh, President Xi Jinping's comments about Shenzhen praising Shenzhen was obviously a message to Hong Kong do you agree uh, I, I think so. Uh, it's a different area. Like, they have their own strength. Obviously, Hong Kong continue, uh, continues to enjoy its uh, uh, position as a financial center uh, in Asia, for example, at least. And in that sense, Shenzhen uh, is catching up, I would say, uh, in that area. At the same time, you know, the two cities can cooperate with each other. For example, there are a lot of talents from the uh, higher institutions in Hong Kong that can be I would say, uh, find their, uh, you know, their areas, they can give full play of their talents in Shenzhen, actually. DJT is a good example of uh, the outcome of cooperation, you know, between teaching staff and students from uh, Hong Kong, and then they find their place in Shenzhen, uh, with the Shenzhen high-end manufacturing. Uh, that's a perfect combination, and then you have DJT, DJI. Uh, James, uh, some years ago, I was in California with a, a venture capitalist at an incubator out there, and he said that he, he loved startups, loved investing in them, but as they grew, they were less nimble, they became bureaucratic, there were problems, he'd spin them off because he just loved the vibrancy, the energy of a, a startup. And I guess the question about Shenzhen is it continues to grow, and these, some of these institutions that started as startups that become behemoths in a way, how do they guard against that, what made Shenzhen so special? How do you keep that going? Well, Shenzhen uh, I was the best kept secret of China, but really, I mean, the, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, there's uh, uh, international media organizations coming to do documentaries about Shenzhen uh, about every month now. 
And um, it's just, uh, it's incredible to see, uh, you know, how these, uh, these government guidelines have really helped uh, Shenzhen grow into this entrepreneurial city. Um, you know, we can see, you know, really direct support from the government uh, with, uh, you know, the top party figures coming, uh, you know, and uh, there, there were so many funds created to cr uh, create innovation uh, and to help uh, entrepreneurs become entrepreneurs. Because, you know, in China, uh, you know, the, the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese, Chinese parents always, you know, want their kids to have a stable job. And it's taken, you know, a couple of years uh, for this mentality to turn into, into that everyone wants to become an entrepreneur. And Shenzhen uh, created, you know, it went from, uh, I was at the grand opening of Shenzhen's first uh, maker space, co-working space, uh, and uh, from that one space, uh, we actually uh, were uh, we, we saw like about 500 spaces open up. So uh, you know, for uh, for Shenzhen, there's so many opportunities here for everyone. Yeah, it seems like the growth just keeps on going. Um, Yan Liang, uh, as you look at it, Shenzhen today home to eight Fortune 500 firms, recognizable names, we know them, Huawei, Tencent. Uh, nearly 300 Fortune 500 enterprises have settled in the city. One of the points that President Xi made was that he, he's trying to bring in international talent to Shenzhen. How inviting is Shenzhen for international talent? How do you recruit it? How do you keep it? Well, I think that's a great question. I think um, your previous speaker talked about the entrepreneurship, and I think that um, competitiveness, that you know, attraction of um, international talent is one of the best, I think, the um, forces for Shenzhen to grow. So um, first of all, I think the Shenzhen government has a lot more autonomy um, in terms of attracting foreign talent um, that are able to use different incentive devices to attract. And they're also giving you know, more autonomy to uh, reform, for example, the household registrations uh, uh, hukou, uh, policy, um, as well as you know, the labor market, uh, you know, the, the regulations. So they're able to sort of ease some of the restrictions in attracting international talent. And so I think that's one, one um, aspect. And then the second aspect is I think there is this um, huge emulative effects, right? So um, as the previous speaker also talked about, there are so many businesses in Shenzhen. You know, um, there are registered 3 million businesses in Shenzhen. If you think about the population of 12 million, you know, every uh, four people, it, it's a, one of them is an entrepreneur. So I think that gives really this competitive and also emulative effect to attract people who are, you know, creative, who are hardworking um, to come to Shenzhen. Um, and also because I think um, the, the location of Shenzhen, right, that it has a lot more already uh, immigrants from both China and also from um, other countries. Um, it creates a very dynamic and vibrant community. And so I think that would be really conducive to attracting foreign talents. Michael, we were talking about the Silicon Valley and, and Shenzhen. How inviting is it uh, for international workers to think, well, maybe I'm going to Shenzhen. That's where I can make my fortune. I mean, somewhat. I think it's something that could definitely be even enhanced. I think that the more that China is able to utilize the city as a place, as a gateway, and attract uh, the smartest minds and, and richest investors and institutions around the world, the greater potential. And I, I, I don't think that it can quite rival the Silicon Valley in terms of attracting talent. But, you know, Silicon Valley has competition, and I think it definitely beholds the United States to continue to be welcoming to people from all of the world, including, of course, China. And James, uh, you know, when an anniversary comes, it's always common to look backwards. But, but what makes Shenzhen kind of special is they're also looking forward. Um, they've got this digital yuan, a big chunk of this digital money uh, being issued to 50,000 residents there. Talk to me about how that's working and what does that do in terms of uh, taking China that next step towards a cashless society? You know, in, in uh, situations like this, uh, where the government really wants to promote innovation, they're so fast at it. I mean, this is called sends and speed, right? Uh, nowhere else in the world uh, can something be implemented so effectively. I mean, it's we just heard about this not too long ago. And it's already, I mean, everyone's already downloading, you know, the apps. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, the digital UN is, is here. I mean, uh, the government's giving out about $3 million, I believe, 
of uh, free money uh, just to uh, randomly to people who download the wallet. And this is a great way to uh, encourage uh, the usage of blockchain. And this is uh, really the hottest technology right now over here. Uh, Sensen's excelled in so many different technologies. Uh, I mean, of course, it started out as a manufacturing hub, but now, I mean, there's uh, uh, you know all these software incubators. There's uh, the blockchain incubators, and it's really more about uh, finding all the different innovations in the world that uh, um, are able to be uh, to be done. And Sensen's doing it. And Yan Leong, uh, talk to me about the digital yuan, this, this experiment. And, and experimenting is a big part of what's made Shenzhen so special, right? Exactly. Um, as um, Xin Doshu talked about, this is a hotbed for, for any experiment, including digital currency and internationalization of um, the RMB uses. Um, so what the government has done is to give 10, bill, 10 million uh, digital currency as a lottery system um, to give the free money to people to use. So on the one hand, I think this is an experiment to see how this payment system works, um, the clearing and payment system, because this would facilitate cross-border um, you know, interbanking transactions and uh, security trading and any types of financial transactions. Um, it's also very helpful um, as a way to track how monetary policy may or may not work. Um, so this is the next big thing, I think, um, on China's uh, uh, you know, digitization and internationalization of the RMB use. So Shenzhen, yes, is going to be this interesting experimental field. And Shindo, uh, what's also interesting is we're focusing on Shenzhen, but it's, but it's even the larger area, the Greater Bay Area, which we've done a lot of stories about this and how much emphasis uh, the central government is putting on this area. And, and when you look at the numbers, uh, they're, they're pretty impressive. It's home to 70 million people, produces 37 percent of the country's export. Closer integration obviously would be important. What is the vision there for the Greater Bay Area, would you say? And what's Shenzhen's place in all of that? Uh, well, Shenzhen is expected to play a leading role in this Great Bay Area. Uh, for example, Shenzhen is uh, becoming, actually, uh, or is expected to be uh, the innovation-driven uh, development. Uh, uh, Shenzhen probably in the in a prime uh, place compared to other cities, uh, for example, including Hong Kong, Macau, or other uh, 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 cities in Guangzhou province. Um, the, so basically now you have the two strongest cities here, that is uh, uh, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. They will play a very important role in integrating the nine cities, the 12 cities uh, together, uh, giving you know, a full display of their own potential, their own strength uh, to build an uh, integrated area uh, of not only high-end manufacturing, but also innovation, but also financial uh, including uh, fintech uh, financing over there in this region. Uh, so many people would say, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, China, uh, you know, Greater Bay Area is the future here. And James, uh, we've done stories on this uh, cross sea bridge. It, it links uh, mainland Guangzhou with uh, Macau and Hong Kong. Uh, we've done a lot about this integration. Talk to me about what, what the buzz is there in Shenzhen about the Greater Bay Area and its importance. Now, uh, uh, well, Shenzhen is uh, now Shenzhen is connected uh, more than ever to uh, the rest of the Greater Bay Area. Uh, it really is a matter of you know Shenzhen was such a key place, and it's really outgrown itself. And now uh, it needs more places to grow, and it needs to be connected with uh, Zhuhai, with Guangzhou, uh, with Hong Kong, with Macau. And uh, I mean, we can see like, for example. Uh, Back in the day, I used to take a bus uh, from uh, from like Lohu uh, Shenzhen bus station to uh, Zhuhai, let's say. Uh, I mean, and the ride would take like three, four hours. Uh, then they created the ferry, and now there's a uh, bridge that connects directly uh, the entire Greater Bay Area. So I mean, everything is becoming more and more efficient, and. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, I see a lot in the future, uh, in the next uh, five to 10 years. And Yan Leong, uh, talk to us about fitting all these pieces together and, and what the potential is there. 
Right, so the potential is definitely this scale economy, this positive networking effects that when you bring all these areas together, um, they're going to play a very sort of com complementary role um, where, you know, one place may be good at manufacturing and we have the logistics in Hong Kong or finance in Shenzhen and high tech, etc. cetera. So um, China is very keen on building that interconnectivity and the kind of clustering effect. So I think that is a strength. And the other thing I think you also mentioned earlier that there is this kind of natural competition, right, sort of between Shenzhen and, and, and uh, Hong Kong. So I think the point is here not to, um, you know, make these different cities peak against each other, but rather to cooperate and collaborate with each other and build that scale effect. Um, so I think, again, by bringing all these different cities together, like you said, 11 of them, um, which account you know, for $1.65 trillion of GDP, um, I think there's a lot of uh, merits. But of course, um, it remains to be seen how exactly these, these cities are able to co cooperate and, and collaborate. Yeah, meshing them together uh, may be somewhat difficult. But James, let me ask you about the five-year plan for Xinjiang. It was recently published. It points to the city becoming a link between China's financial market and the global market. How do you think that might work? And are we going to see the yuan perhaps used more often as an international currency? Absolutely. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the heart of it right now. And uh, I live in Shanghai, which is uh, the new free trade zone. There used to be the Futian Free Trade Zone. Now is the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, and this is uh, going to be the financial center of Shenzhen. Uh, there's, you know, there's so many international um, new regulations that have come out, which have really opened up China, and uh, I can only see uh, that the yuan is going to go international uh, much faster than we uh, had anticipated. So let's talk about five years out. Yeah, look into your crystal ball. What does Shenzhen look like five years from now? Well, uh, five years from now, let's see. Uh, well, I can tell you, uh, when I first came to Shenzhen, I opened up my company. Uh, I, had, uh, I was paying an average of uh, 1,500 RMB a month uh, for, uh, for my staff, uh, which is about $200. And now, I mean, even the... The average uh, factory worker makes over 4,000 RMB a month. Uh, that's over $800 a month uh, just working at a factory assembly line. So, I mean, the, the, the wealth that's poured into Shenzhen is incredible. Uh, I live in a $3 million apartment. Uh, and, and this is uh, all due to Shenzhen. I mean, this is, uh, I can live, my neighbors and I can live anywhere in the world, can live in New York. Uh, in Paris, and everyone chooses Shenzhen uh, because it, it's so incredible. Uh, and you know, five years from now, I can't even imagine because uh, six months. You know, it's, it's been like six months, yeah. and the entire Shanghai area has wow. already uh, changed so yeah. much. So, well, James, John, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, you sound enthusiastic. That's great to see, and, and we'll check in with you in five years. How's that? Uh, thank you all for joining us. That's all for this edition of The Heat. The conversation continues online. Chat with us about this or any other show on Twitter or at CGTN America or visit us on Facebook. Thanks so much for watching.